What's happening everyone? Al Siebes here. Thanks so much for joining our live stream. Today we're covering the topic of how real estate outperforms stock every time. I'm gonna be going through both the wealth building aspects of real estate into the income building aspects of real estate into the capital and ra raising capital. What if you don't have the money to buy real estate? So I'd love it if you stick through all the way through and hit that subscribe button. If you want more content like this, you'll get updated. Give us a like and thanks for being a part of this today. Now let's jump in to the live stream. What's happening everyone, Al Siebes here. Welcome to our first ever live stream training. I was challenged to cover the topic real estate versus stocks by someone. So we're gonna hit that today as a wealth building strategy. We're gonna hit the pros and the cons and I'm gonna save a lot of great information for the end. If you maybe you don't have the money to get into to real estate, I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about some other things at the end and I'm gonna answer any questions. So if you post down below during this, if you put a, put a message down below for us, a comment or a question, I'm gonna address questions at the end. We're gonna also have some free giveaways today. I'm gonna to give away a free rental analysis calculator where you can run the numbers on any rental property that you're looking at. Just post down below, everyone will get a link to that. If you post down below or ask a question. I'll also put you in a raffle for a one hour free Zoom consulting call where I will look at any real estate deal that you're looking at and give you feedback and input for based on my 20 years of experience as a real estate investor. So without further ado, I look forward to diving in to this topic, real estate versus stocks. I'm gonna give you some of the pros, I'm gonna give you some of the cons, but first of all, I'm gonna grab my handy dandy notebook here uh, so that I can cover a lot of the details that I need to cover very quickly. Uh, pause, <laughs> you're gonna have to edit. Um, your reflection is coming. Um, the iPad and your watch or something? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's your first edit. <laughs> we good? Yep. Should I roll? Okay. All right, so first of all, we're gonna start with the big numbers, what the majority of people are already in. When it comes to real estate, 65%, 65% of homes in the United States, I'm just gonna put SFR, single family residences, are owner occupied, okay? owner. That's a W. Owner. 65% <laughs> are owner occupied. So we already have a lot of people that are kind of in the real estate game here. Now with stocks, the stat is that 55%, 55%, 55 uh, of people are in an employer retirement plan. I'm just gonna put employ retirement. And these are plans where basically the employer will often match uh, you know, your contribution. So you, you contribute towards the entire retirement plan and your employer also contributes towards that retirement plan. So they, they match and that, that's very popular or you may have some other type of program that your employer does and 55% people are involved in that. So there's a lot of people already in stocks and already in real estate. However, we're gonna go a step further. What if you wanted to double down and get involved in some of this as a wealth building strategy? That's what we're gonna look at. So in real estate, we have a bunch of different categories. First of all, we've got residential real estate. Okay, and then we've got commercial real estate. Okay, in residential real estate, we've got single family homes. We've got um, 
different strategies like we've got buy, fix, and sell. So let's just call it a flip. You can flip. We've got a rental. You know, you can be doing like a buy and hold essentially, which we've done all of these, a lot of all of these. And then in commercial, you've got things, you've got everything from office to um, apartments. And then um, things like triple nets. And again, not, that might be a term you're not familiar with. I don't have time to cover it all, but it's just a, a strategy, commercial real estate investing, we'll cover another time. You've got retail, et cetera. Okay, so that is some of the ways to invest in real estate. I'm just trying to cover the big ones. In stocks, okay, you've got, we've already mentioned the employer retirement. Um, so I'll just put uh, employer. You've got different strategies through your employer to invest in a retirement plan. Then you've got, of course, just stocks in general. Okay, and then you've got maybe mutual funds. I'll just put mutual. Okay, so you've got all these different strategies. We're gonna kind of bob and weave in and out of this. And what we're gonna cover is some of the pros and cons in both of these. Some of the pros and cons in stock, some of the pros and cons in real estate, and then we're gonna dive into some of the major advantages that I found in real estate, major advantages to accelerate um, wealth. And then we're gonna answer your questions and talk about what if you don't have the money to get into real estate and talk about some of those strategies. So I'm looking forward to diving in. Before we go any further, I wanna show you just some brief things that we're doing on our YouTube channel. Check it out. So in the last 365 days, the reporting on the app here is telling me I made $63,200 in income by using this strategy. That's what I'm talking about. Let's figure out how to do more of this. All right, welcome back. So real estate versus stocks. We're going to dive in a little deeper. Let me take this one off here and we will go into the pros and cons of stocks. I'm gonna take this handy dandy guy and put this over here. We can reference it later if we want. Okay, so stocks, pro and cons of stocks. Let's take a look at the pros first. With stocks, first of all, they're very liquid. Okay, stocks are liquid. So that means you can buy a stock and then you can go and sell a stock shortly after buying it very quickly. It's very fluid, okay? The other pro in, in, in stocks is you can diversify very easily. So you could buy a stock in one industry and buy a stock in a completely different industry and you can diversify your portfolio. Um, stocks, a pro is it's a low cost to sell. Okay. So you do get charged a brokerage fee to, to buy and sell stocks, but it's a, it's a relatively low cost. And I'm kind of going to spin these and compare this to real estate. The other pro is you may have an employer that will sponsor employer that will sponsor part of your like retirement plan. They may even match or contribute towards it. And that's a huge pro in, in stocks. The cons, you have no control. Okay. And this is a big problem for me. I do invest in stocks, I have invested in stocks, but I have no control over the direction or the stock. I can't improve the stock. 
So, you know, with, with, with a real estate opportunity, with a rental like I'm in, I can rip these ceilings out or and I can make, the, make it open ceiling and, and improve the value, improve the desirability, improve the rental ability. There's a lot of things I can do to increase the value of a rental, right? On a stock, if I own Apple stock, I can't go in and go, hey guys, look, I think the way you're doing this or doing that is you should change it and we'd sell a lot more or we'd make a lot more. I have no control. Also, I have no control over them making bad decisions or things going wrong from their leadership, et cetera, et cetera. I have little to no control. Unless you're Warren Buffett and you buy most of the company and you take control, then that's great. But generally, I have no control. Also, the volatility. of stocks is dramatic. Stocks are can be very volatile. You could buy a stock and it could be worth a fraction of what you paid for it the next day, which is extreme volatility. Now, of course, we have a market that has relative stability and it's rare that your stock would be worth half of what you paid for it the next day, but it happens and values fluctuate wildly. That's why people who are in a lot of stocks stay glued to the little stock ticker, they're just watching it. Real estate, that does not happen. You can almost predict the trends and the changes that are coming. I say almost, you can. You can, it, it, you can see it coming. You can see the storm approaching. Whereas in stocks, you don't know to, till after it's happened. Okay, major taxes on gains. Major taxes. So on stocks, you are taxed heavily. And we'll talk about the flip side of that in real estate. But if you sell a stock and you make a big gain, you are taxed on that gain right away. Okay? So there's major tax gains. Um, and it can, you know, I, I put in my notes that it can mirror gambling. Um, is it a gamble? Are you literally buying a stock because you've heard it's going to go up? Because that's gambling, literally. Um, if you're just throwing money and, and thinking, well, I heard this or I heard that, it, that is a complete gamble. And we're not fans of gambling when it comes to investing. So, um, yeah, that is the pros and the cons of stocks. Now, let's look at real estate. And before we do that, Check out one more thing we're doing on our YouTube channel. What's happening everyone, Alan here, and today I'm gonna to talk about how I lived in a Los Angeles apartment for free. And I'm gonna break it down so that you can also get your free apartment. It's like I'm giving out free apartments today. Even if you have no experience with this, I'm gonna break it down step by step on how to get in. Let's dig in. All right, we're back and we're gonna now take the stock pro and cons and move them over to the side here. And we are gonna dive into the pro and cons of real estate. So, with real estate, a major, um, basically a major pro is that it's easy to understand. Okay, you do not need a massive degree, uh, and not that you do in stock either, but stocks can be much more challenging to understand than purchasing a property. There can be much more that goes into it. Now, I'm all about education and getting as much education as you can in real estate to, to go forward in a wise sort of way, but it is easier to understand than stocks in general. Real estate is a level playing field. What do I mean by that? Well, basically, when you're looking at stocks, you are competing against some major, major players that have access to information and speeds of trading that you do not as a small player. In real estate, that level field is much more easy to compete on. Because I have 20 years experience in doing this, 
but there's people that have little to no experience that find deals that I can't find. And they're able to do deals because the playing field is pretty open. They heard about it through the mailman or they heard about something from someone and it's not a technology playing field where I'm competing against major big corporations or traders that have access to way more information than I do. So it levels the playing field a bit. The debt is safer. Debt. Safe. So the debt is safer. So basically with the debt in real estate, it is much safer than if you tried to do debt in stocks, like trading by margin. Trading by margin is extremely risky and you can be called up on your debt and it, 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 it puts a lot of people under when they trade on margin in a way that is taking major risk. The debt on real estate is much, much safer and it's pretty incredible. We'll go into that a little bit uh, here at the end. Now, it's an inflation hedge. Do you realize uh, how much, I think you do, our government is spending right now? And that that doesn't necessarily equal inflation is coming immediately or whatever, but inflation tends to come in seasons of tons of government spending, et cetera, et cetera. Now, real estate is a major inflation hedge. When inflation kicks in, when the cost of everything goes up, the cost of real estate goes up, the cost of rent goes up, rent appreciates, rent adjusts to inflation, real estate adjusts to inflation. Therefore, it's an inflation hedge. Major tax advantages. I'm talking major tax advantages and I'll only just hit a couple of them right here. Advantages, ADV. There we go. <laughs> Major tax advantages. So with the tax advantages, the first one I wanted to mention is you can actually defer your gains. When you sell real estate, there is all kinds of way for you to defer your gains. You can do a 1031 exchange and purchase another property. There's ways you can transfer into a a, a trust in, into even investments and there is a lot of ways that the tax law makes for you to be able to defer that tax and invest the money where I sold a property and my tax would have been 40% on the gain. We're talking a, a significant amount of money and I was able to move that money somewhere else to another property and not pay the taxes on the gain. Also, you can shelter the cash flow. So your income as opposed to, you can make income on, on stocks, right? You can get dividends, um, but you can shelter the cash flow through all of the deductions. And that is the last one here is deduct. Through all of the deductions, you get deductions. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, through all of the deductions that you get, you can shelter that cash flow. You get to deduct uh, anything you're spending on the property. There's mortgage interest deductions. There's all kinds of deductions that shelter the cash flow. You can be improving the property, improving the value of the property, and all of those expenses are deductions. So major pros. Now the cons. Well, what are the cons to real estate? Well, there are some. First of all, there can be some sweat involved. All right. Now stocks can make you sweat too, but this is a different kind of sweat. This is like you may have to actually work on the property or you may get calls of someone's plumbing being clogged or whatever at an inconvenient time. Uh, you may have a property manager who deals with that. That's great. But either way, if I'm going to increase value of my property, there's usually some sweat involved. Either that means me contributing towards it or me doing some of the work, et cetera, et cetera. That can be a con. Some people just don't even want to deal with it at all. And I get that. Real estate is maybe not for everyone, right? So second is um, you, can, you can basically um, not, it, it, it's not liquid, okay? So it's not liquid. 
It's not easy to sell real estate. You can't just go, hey, let's sell it. We'll get the money tomorrow. We'll move it here, move it there. It's a process to sell real estate. It's just not as liquid as stocks, okay? Finally, it's not easily diversified. So you can diversify in real estate, but it's not easy to diversify, and I don't always recommend it. In other words, if you're buying real estate in all different categories or all different locations, you want to diversify locations, then it be can become kind of a management nightmare. So you generally are buying similar types of real estate or in similar areas, et cetera, et cetera. So you may not be diversified. There's ways to watch out for that. I'll give you one example right now. For example, if you buy in an area that's heavily, maybe it's a military base area and the primary uh, employer is military. Well, if that area gets hit by military budget cutbacks, you're going to get hit and you're not diversified. And so you want to watch out for areas where it's dominated by a single employer or a single industry. But that can be a con to real estate is that you may not be as diversified. Now, I'm going to go into next the five major benefits, how you can hit up to 20% or more ROI in real estate. That's uh, uh, your return on your cash, on the money you're putting in next. I'm going to hit that and then we're going to cover questions. So again, please post your questions. Um, if you just tuned into our live, live stream here, post your questions or your comments. I'm going to cover the questions at the end. Anyone who's posting, we're going to give a link to a free calculator to analyze any sort of rental property you may be looking at. And you're going to be entered into a raffle for a free one hour Zoom consulting session on any property you're looking at. I'll give you a free one hour analysis on that property and feedback. So before I dive into the five major benefits that can push you into a over 20% return on investment in real estate, check out this that we're doing on our YouTube channel. Alan here. Today we're talking about house hacking, how to live for free by investing in multifamily properties. That could be two units, four units. It could be a house with a guest house. It could be a house with some land and some yurts on it. I've seen that or a tiny home community or whatever. There's lots of scenarios, but basically how to live for free, nothing out of your pocket towards the mortgage by house hacking. All right, welcome back to our live stream training. And I just covered the pros and cons of real estate versus the pros and cons of stock. I'm gonna move the real estate one over here and we're gonna talk about the five benefits of real estate. And this is where wealth building can go to a whole new level. If you're still with me on the real estate, um, this is where it can go to a whole new level where return on investment can increase well above 20% even in a conservative way and a conservative strategy. So I'm going to move this over here and then we are going to cover these five benefits really quick. Now, the first one, and maybe it's obvious, is that real estate produces cash flow. Now, of course, I mentioned stocks can produce cash flow. They can produce dividends. If you own, a, you have to own a lot of stock to get a good amount of dividend income. Real estate, you don't necessarily have to own a lot. Matter of fact, I gave a one hour consulting the other day to someone who um, was looking at a $20,000 home on the East Coast, a $20,000 rental property. Now, the property did need work. It needed about $25,000 worth of work. But the rental amount on the property, it was like a house and believe it or not, like a little guest house behind it. And um, the rental income would have been like $1,100 a month. So that is a relatively small investment, especially if she leverages her purchase. But cash flow. Now let's say your cash flow, I'm going to kind of run a return column over here. Let's say your cash flow is, let's just use a nice easy number. It's 10%. Okay. 10% uh, return on whatever you're putting into the property. Okay, so you're putting, so if you're putting $100,000 into the property, you're making 
$10,000 a month for just nice, simple numbers. Maybe you're putting, uh, sorry, you're making 10,000 a year. Maybe you're putting $10,000 into a property and you're going to be making $1,000 off of that annually. Okay. So either way, we're looking at a cash flow, nice, easy number of 10%. The second benefit of real estate is appreciation. Okay. And appreciation, you may argue, well, yeah, property goes up, property goes down. However, what is very interesting over a long period of time about appreciation is appreciation goes up over time because as we just talked about in one of the pros of real estate, that was that real estate adjusts to inflation. So real estate is an inflation hedge. So as prices of whatever goes up, gas, groceries, etc., real estate also goes up and rent goes up. There's rental appreciation. So the income on real estate also appreciates this number. But on our appreciation, let's give a very conservative number of, let's just say 5%, okay? Now, some of the coastal areas have seen much more dramatic, like the West Coast, the East Coast, much more appreciation than 5%, but let's just say 5% appreciation, all right? Now, the next benefit of real estate is debt pay down. So typically, when you're buying real estate, you are taking out debt, and that debt is being paid down. Now, who's paying down that debt? The tenants are paying down the debt, not you. This is a rental property, this is an investment property we're talking about, and the debt is being paid down every month. When you make that mortgage payment, debt is being paid down. Now, that's a real return. That real return on a mortgage calculator can amount to 5%, okay? Every year, your debt is being paid down, your net worth is going up 5%, okay? So now, we're at our, th we're at our three benefits, we're already at a 20% return. Third, the, the, the fourth one, sorry, the third was debt pay down, the fourth, fourth one is tax shelter. Okay, so real estate is a major tax shelter. Now that is huge in so many ways. We've already talked about how income on real estate can be sheltered. Also, real estate is depreciated on your books. The accountants have made it that you can depreciate real estate. So on the books, on your taxes, it shows your real estate going down in value every year. When in reality, it is most likely going up in value on the books, it shows it going down in value. I'm not even gonna put what that return could be for you here, but depending on your tax bracket, the higher your tax bracket, the higher that return could be for you. But either way, that is real because that's money you're not paying in taxes that you would be paying in taxes if you didn't own this piece of real estate. Now, the fifth one, and this is massive, the fifth one is leverage, okay? Now, on leverage, which leverage is just incredible right now, how cheap it is. It is just mind-blowing to think about this leverage. This is something you can't do in stock at all like this. And this is how mind-blowing it is. Literally, a bank can come to you and say, at least here in the United States for our international viewers, but in, in the United States, a bank will say, look, if you're buying real estate, we will loan you money to buy real estate at a very, very attractive interest rate. And that is amazing to me because you just have to think about it. Even if you're putting, let's say you're putting 20% down, okay, on a real estate purchase, that bank is gonna give you 80% of the funds, almost like a partner, right? The bank is like a partner with you on this deal. But as a partner, they've got the, they've got the bad end of the deal because they're putting up 80% of the money. Imagine, imagine I presented that to you, that you were gonna be my partner, and I said, here's the deal. I got this deal, I want you to put up 80% of the money, I'm gonna give you three to 4% on your money, and then everything else uh, I get. All the income I get, 
all the appreciation I get, all the tax benefits I get, all you get, you're gonna put up 80% of the money, you're gonna put most of the money for the deal, and I'm just gonna give you, you know, three, 4%, and that's it. And that's what banks do. That is the leverage that you get to use, and watch what that does to our numbers. So, on the leverage, when you are leveraged, and, and you are getting these kind of returns, if you put, let's, let's go back to our, kind of our, our $100,000, and this was one of the questions that, um, that was coming in as we were prepping this. But if you put down, let's say uh, 10%, so you put down a $100,000 on a property, nice even numbers on a million dollar property. For some of you, that's incredibly pricey. For some of you, that's just a starter property, <laughs> depending on where you live in the country. But let's say you put down $100,000 now, and, and you're getting cash flow of again, nice easy numbers. This is not gonna be realistic in some parts of the country and it might be more realistic in others. But you're getting a cash flow of 10%. So on that 100,000, you're getting $10,000 a month, right? And you've leveraged, okay? So with that leverage, now when we go down here and we go to appreciation, if appreciation is 5% on a million dollar property, okay, 5% on a million dollar property is how much? Write in the answer down below. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so 5% on a million dollar property is $50,000. Okay, so I'm just gonna write that in here. So let's just say 50K. Our property's gone up in, in value, right? Fair enough, million dollar property goes up 5%, $50,000. Now, what is that return on our investment on this property? How much did we put in? We put in $100,000. We just went up $50,000 with a simple 5%. I'm not counting if like you had a more rapid appreciation like 10% or 20%, just 5%. You've gone up $50,000. You put in $100,000, right? So we're gonna just put 100,000 right here, 100K in. We got a $50,000 uh, appreciation. That is a 50% return on your money, right? 50% because of leverage. That is mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing that you've made a 50% return. Now you could say to me, hey, Alan, that's not a real return. That's equity in the property. That's, that's, you know, that's not guaranteed, et cetera, et cetera. True, however, what if 5% happens every year for 10 years? Because that's happened, that's happened to us. 5% every year for 10 years, and you're making a 50% return, and then you go to sell that property. And let's even, let's be extreme here. Let's say five of the, those 10 years, there was zero appreciation. So you made 5% for five years, right? Which again, I'm not factoring in each year rolling, but 5% for five years, 50,000 for five years, let's just say five years would be, whoa, hang on, five years would be 250, okay? Now you've got a $250,000 gain in that property, not to mention your debt's being paid down that whole time, right? You've got cash flow, so now, $250,000 you made off of a $100,000 investment. Now you're selling the property. Now there's gonna be some closing costs and other things, but you can see how these five benefits stack up really big to make real estate a very, very viable wealth building method. Now, with that, I'm gonna to jump to some questions next. Before I go there, Type in any questions that you have. We're gonna give away a, a free rental analysis calculator. We're gonna give away a free, we're gonna raffle a free uh, one hour Zoom consulting call on any real estate deal you're looking at. And before I dive into the questions, I'm gonna grab my phone here and look at any of the questions coming up. We're gonna show you one more thing we're doing on YouTube, check it out. What's up everyone, Alan here. Today we're gonna to talk about how I vacation for free. I'm talking about travel, not just local, but internationally. And I'm also talking about staying in homes, not just hotels, not just 
experiences where you're in a room, like if you're traveling with a group of friends, you can be in a home, you can be in separate bedrooms and have your own kitchen and have common areas, barbecue area, yard, you could get a car for free. So let's dig into it, let's get into the details of the deal, how we do this, and I hope you're inspired. All right, we're back live streaming here and I want to make sure we have a quick summary of what we've covered before I go into the questions here, but we've just talked about the five benefits of real estate, major benefits, and how an ROI can really add up when you add in all these layers of benefits, the cash flow, the appreciation, the debt pay down, the tax shelter, and then leveraging. It makes a huge return. And these are the major benefits of real estate. We've compared the pros and the cons to real estate. I'm up here on the wall, you can't see them, but basically we looked at the pros and we looked at the cons, both of real estate and of stocks. There's pros and cons to both. Real estate is not for everybody. I'm not here to say that, but as a wealth building vehicle, if you're willing to take on those pros and take on those cons, it is a major vehicle that can help in wealth building strategies. So. I'm pulling up the questions here that are coming in on my phone. Um, if you have questions, do post below. If you have comments or feedbacks, or maybe you have something you want us to cover in the future, let's take a look at that. Post that down below. So, questions from Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Rental property or property flipping? How to best gain financial independence? How to wisely get started? Okay, so rental property or property flipping. First, before I address Kyle's question, I do wanna say a lot of this comes down to personal um, strategy for a person. Like It's almost like everyone is, everyone's different, right? So it's almost like everyone can have a different strategy, if that makes sense, to meet their needs and meet where they're at in life. Some of you have never owned a property. Some of you already own a bunch of properties. Some of you have a, have a, maybe you have a good job and you have good income and good credit, but you don't, even, you don't own anything real estate related and you want to get into it. And that's fine, but it's different advice for each of those different people. So, but generally speaking, I have to answer these questions generally speaking. He's asking rental property or property flipping. What's the best way to build wealth? So let's look at that. I'm just going to you know, for a buy, fix and sell, we're gonna just call it a flip. It's kind of the, maybe the, I don't know if it's the slang or whatever for it. And then we're gonna call the other one um, rental property, we're gonna call it a hold. Okay, one of the best books that I've read on buy, buy and hold real estate is actually called Hold, H-O-L-D. Uh, Gary Keller and some other authors did that and I highly recommend it. Um, I'll try to link you to it down below if we can do that. But basically, that's a fantastic book to read. Now, we're going to compare flipping or holding real estate, which is the best strategy. Again, there's pros and cons, and it depends on your position and where you're at. With a, with a, and it also depends, I would say, on priorities. Like, do you own the property you live in? And is that, should that be a, pri a priority? And, and should you consider house hacking? Like it's one of the strategies we talk about on YouTube where you would own the property but also rent out part of the property to subsidize the, the, subsidize the mortgage or, or possibly even cover the whole mortgage while you live there um, depending on the, on the type of property because you can own or occupy up to four units. So it could be a fourplex where you live in one of the units or you live in, even it could be a separate house and the rental units are in the back or whatever and that rental income is covering part or all of your mortgage. That's called a house hack. So a lot of those things go into play. I would probably start the conversation there. Like, okay, before we get into whether you're gonna flip or whether you're gonna hold, is do you own your property and is that something that we should start with. Not everyone needs to own their property. You can just jump right to this while you're renting and that's fine. There's different reasons why you should rent over owning. Maybe you're gonna live in an area for 
three months and after that you don't know if your job's continuing in that area. Well then I would say don't buy the property you live in, just rent until you figure out if you're gonna be putting down roots there. So a lot of that will depend. But let's talk generally speaking. So on a flip, um, generally speaking, uh, flips are in my mind more risky than holding. When you're holding a property, um, I'm just gonna put a uh, risk here. Of course there's risks with anything, but in my mind, flips are more risky. I have not done a flip and I've done over a hundred flips and I have not done a flip in um, at least five years. I've not done a flip. And so the numbers have been too hard for me to make sense on the flips that I'm looking at. So there is risk in that. The, the, the margin for error is much tighter than if you're gonna hold. If you're gonna hold, let's say, for example, you overspend on a property. Like let's run a worst case scenario here. Let's say you buy a property and you're like, oh man, it, it needs more than I thought it needs, right? Which happens. And so you overspend. Well, on the hold, there's gonna be more forgiveness because you can hold that property and you can rent it out and you can be collecting income. And while you're doing that, the property will be increasing in value. Some of these benefits will kick in. Your, your cash flow, um, it'll appreciate. You'll get all these benefits that kick in and make up for the fact that you may have overspent on that property. So by making sure the numbers work, that's, a, that's one thing you want to really pay attention to is the numbers on either of these. But if the numbers work, the numbers can be more generous to you on a hold if you end up spending too much or making some mistakes than on a flip. Because if a flip is not a good hold property because whatever because of how much it costs and it won't really the rental income won't really cover it and all of that. So if a flip is not a good hold property and you spend too much and you have to sell it, guess what? That's going to hurt. It's going to be what we call a haircut or whatever. It's going to, you know, that's going to cost you. And so a hold can be more kind and more generous. Thanks, Kyle. That's a great question. Um, some other things to think about is that um, generally flips are a way, if you do find a good flip, they're a way to make some quick money, right? Okay, yeah, you can make money. So we'll just do some dollar signs there. You can make funny, funny, you can make funny, it's not funny, you can make money doing a flip. I used money and flip in the same word. You can make money doing a flip, however, you build wealth holding, okay? How many of you on this live stream know someone who's owned a real estate property for more than 20 years. Let's say they've owned it for 30 years. Are they doing okay? Yes, they're doing okay. Unless they pulled out all the equity and you know did something crazy with it, which people did, uh, especially at the last recession in 2008, 9, 10. Um, but if they were conservative and they've owned real estate for 20 or 30 years, they're doing well with it. So ultimately, yes, you can make money uh, doing a flip, but you're gonna ultimately build wealth on the holds, okay? So on that note, the flip um, is going to be much more intensive. Um, it, the intensity is increased much, much more on the flip than the hold. I think that's another way to look at this um, because the intensity of all of the things, the timing, usually on the flip, um, I'm just gonna do an up arrow, the intensity, this is intensity. <laughs> on a flip, uh, the up arrow, which is not necessarily a good, I'm gonna do like not a good intensity. You know, you have money that is on the line that sometimes is being borrowed either at a high interest rate, some flips are being done with what's called a hard money loan, um, and there is a lot of intensity there that it has to be done by a certain amount of time. Where with the hold, you might get a more traditional bank to finance it and there's just more chill. It's just more, what am I, gonna, I'm gonna draw a hammock. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do a hammock for, this is just more chill, right? Um, especially as you get it going, then you're laying here in your hammock. I am like the worst artist ever, but you're laying here in your hammock and you're able to kind of sit back 
and enjoy these benefits. These benefits are kicking in right here of real estate. The benefits of cash flow and uh, as my whole uh, thing crashes here, this is what's fun about doing live is stuff just crashes and falls everywhere. But um, these benefits are kicking in. So while you're holding, you are um, getting all these benefits, which it's just awesome because you're getting the appreciation. And then if you've leveraged that appreciation, that ROI could be 50%, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you're enjoying these five benefits while holding. So ultimately, I would say you make your money doing whatever it is, fill in the blank. That could be flipping homes. You make your money, but then you make your wealth holding. So in real estate, we see this all over. We see with high net worth people that they make their money doing one thing. And, and you could make some money doing flipping, but most high net worth people are not making their money doing flipping. But for, for you, for I, it might be a great strategy to, to build some money. But let's say they're making money as a surgeon, okay? So as a surgeon, um, I am busy during the day doing surgeries. I have long days and I make good money. I am probably not gonna be flipping homes, okay? I do know some surgeons that have partnered with us on flipping, but they were more of just a financing partner. But generally speaking, surgeons are not out flipping homes because they're doing surgery. That's how they're making their money. Now, they're creating wealth with that money they're making by buying real estate and holding it. So do you see some of the difference there? You're making money flipping and then you're building wealth holding. Good question, Kyle. Thank you. All right, question from Daniel. Uh, if I have 100,000 to invest and uh, over five years uh, of growth, I've got stock and real estate, um, each producing about a 10% return, how much would I, will I end up after five years? Oh man, I feel like I'm starting to sweat, like I gotta get my math going here, right? <laughs> it factor in that um, 100,000 I'm gonna use as a 10% as a down payment for a million dollar house, um, so, okay, that makes sense. Good question, Daniel. Okay, so you've got 100K, right? And for some of you, that could be much less. You could have 10K. For others of you, that could be a million in, in liquid cash that you're looking to invest. But let's just take a nice easy number, 100,000. Now, you said you're gonna invest for five years, okay? I'm just gonna put our parameters up here. Five years, okay? Now, uh, what else did you say? You're gonna get 10%, 10%, and we're comparing stock, right? What you'll do in stock, and then what you'll do in real estate. Oh, this is gonna be good. I like where you're going with this, okay. Real estate. Okay, so, did I get it all? Yep, factor in, okay, that the 100,000 is gonna be used as a 10% down payment in real estate. Okay, so in real estate, let me set this down, that was a great question. In real estate, the 10% uh, down, so we're gonna own 1 million then in real estate, doing 10% down, okay? And then we're gonna own 100K in stock, okay? Because you're not leveraging like that in stock. All right, now, as 100% as 100,000 in stock, you're gonna get a 10% return, right? So that's gonna be 10,000 a year, 10K. Now, in real estate, you're gonna get a 10% return. Um, that's gonna be 100,000 a year, right? because we're leveraged. There's a major difference in leverage right there now. Um, but I think we need to make this more conservative. Um, just, I, I, I see where you're going. Um, let's say you're gonna get a 10% return. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna get 10% return on your 100K invested, right? So this is gonna also be 10K. Yeah, let's go that way. This is gonna be 10,000 a year, okay? On your 100,000, so you got a 10% um, cash flow. Now, seems pretty equal. 
This is where the, this is where the big, big shift is going to happen. So your stock at 100% thousand, we're also going to give the stock a 5% growth. We're going to be equal 5% growth. That's going to be, um, again, uh, we're just looking at 5,000 a year. And then on the real estate, we've got a uh, 5% growth. However, the big difference is kicking in here. The 5% growth is not on the 100,000. The 5% appreciation is going to be on the million, the, the value of the property. So that's going to be 50K, right? This is kind of similar to the example. I wonder if he's pulling this question off the example we used earlier. But um, you'll see the difference here as we run these numbers with stock. So now 5% um, growth, 5% growth is 50K. Um, all right, so we got 10,000, 10,000. Now we're running this for five years. So on top of that, for stock um, debt pay down, debt pay down is zero. Okay, we don't have any debt being paid down. We have no mortgage on the stock. For the real estate, the debt pay down is going to be, I would just say when we run it on a mortgage calculator, I would say 5% a year. So 5% again on the money invested. So let's just say 5,000 a year, 5,000 a year, 5K a year. And we're at five years, right? So that it's going to be 25K, okay? 25K in debt pay down. All right, so now, we are almost done. We've got our debt pay down. We've got our leverage kicked in here that we're getting a 50% return. Um, also, don't forget, we have a tax shelter here. Okay. Where we're getting deductions every year. So taxes are down on this one. So every year this property is owned, we're getting to depreciate it. We're getting to... Um, write off all of our expenses on the property. All these things are adding up to give us a major tax shelter on this income. So whereas the income on the stock might be 10,000 and then you take out your tax bracket of let's say 20%, um, you're going to take out 2000 of that to pay taxes on this same thing, your tax bracket, maybe it's 20% or a lot higher for some of you it could be 30 plus 40%. Uh, percent. But if it's 20%, you're going to, take out 2000 however you've got all these deductions so really your tax bracket might only be 10 percent so that's already a thousand a year um, more on income because of the tax shelter on real estate so with that said let's total this up we're not going to include the tax benefits in our total with that said on real estate we're at 10,000 plus 50 so we're at 60 plus 25 is going to bring us to 85 85k now on this, we've got um, appreciation of 10 each year, 10,000. Uh, and then we've got, um, we've got our, uh, sorry, we said appreciation of five. We wanted to match real estate. So we've got appreciation of 5%. We got income of 10, so we're at 15K a year, okay? 15K. So we're at 15,000. Let me grab a calculator here. We're at 15,000 and we are at, um, 85,000. If we take that and we multiply that by five, we are at Okay, there's that at number two. <laughs> uh, I can't get my phone or calculator to work. Oh. This is an old phone, so when I try to go to things like, I don't know, do you know how to overwork this phone? Usually you swipe down from the top and go to calculator. What, how did you, oh, and now it has to reinstall? How did you do that? How did you, you just search calculator? Okay. Look at that. Thank you, thank you. Of course. Can you guys 
not mess around. I'm almost done. <laughs> These guys, like bees, they're like flying back at the back window. Oh my gosh. All right, we ready? Uh, should I start with, let me grab my calculator. All right, let me grab my calculator and we're going to run these numbers real quick here. So if we're at 15,000 and Daniel, you said five years. So 15 times five, we'd be at a 75 times five. We'd be at 75. Okay. All right. And then on the real estate, we're at 85 annually times five years. We're at 425 K. 425 versus 75. Massive difference here between real estate and stock in that question. And it almost seems hard to believe, right? That, that it would be that good but then again, if you think about people that have been in real estate for a long time, how good is it, right? It, it adds up over time. Time is often your friend in real estate because over time, these additional leverage pieces benefit you. So that is a great question. Um, any other comments or questions, post them down below and let us know. I'm going to finish with a key piece here. And that is what I call um, other people's money. Okay, so OPM. OPM. This is what a high school professor like opium, like the drug, because it can be a drug. It can. It, it's a tool that you can use. Let's say you do not have the funds to get into real estate. Alan, I don't have a hundred thousand. I don't have money for a down payment, et cetera, et cetera. There are opportunities in real estate to use other people's money. You have to be very wise about it. I recommend you dive deeper, maybe into some of our trainings. You have to have experience um, to do this, but there is a way that you can leverage in real estate. Now that is through various methods. One is that we already talked about. One is through a bank, right? And we talked about that. That is using other people's money. They may leverage you 80%. And that's using other people's money on 80% of the cost of your transaction to leverage into that larger deal. Now, secondly, you can use private money. Okay. Private money is someone you know who will loan you the money to do a real estate transaction. When we bought our first condo, this was in Los Angeles in 2001, we bought our first condo. I needed $9,000 to buy this condo and I didn't have it. <laughs> I didn't have the 9,000. I had like, you know, four, 4,000 something. And, um, we were originally approved. It was back when they were doing these no money down loans and we were approved for a zero money down purchase. And when escrow got towards the end, they all of a sudden said, Hey, you got to come up with 5% down. This is an owner occupied condo that we eventually converted into a rental. But, um, but with that, um, man, I had to come up with this money. And so guess who stepped in? Well, first of all, I realized I had another three and a half thousand set aside for taxes. So that came into play that I wouldn't have to spend on taxes because of the amount, literally the amount of tax benefits I was going to get from buying this place. And then secondly, grandma said, Hey, I've got three and a half thousand. You can also put in to your real estate transaction. And she was literally, she was so sweet. She's like, you can pay me back someday or you don't really have to. I might not even be around. So it doesn't matter. She was totally cute about it and awesome. And then another, so that was a three and a half thousand. And these things came into play where I had relative and I had some other sources that came in to make that down payment happen. Now in private money, there's all kinds of ways to structure it besides just grandma saying, Hey, here's a check, pay me back someday. So with private money, I, I better say this first, you cannot advertise for private money without going through some major like, um, you know, licensing, it can get into SEC, Security and Exchange Commission stuff. You have to be very careful, but you can raise private money from anyone that you know. 
And uh, for me, it's been a lot of our investors that have been involved with us or our clients. I've worked as a commercial real estate agent. I still work as a commercial real estate agent and a residential agent. And I've had clients who have wanted to put money to work. And we use that when we were doing a lot of flips. We've also used it in some of our buy and holds. But you can raise money and, and from people you know, and you can offer them a return on their money. So there's a lot of ways to do that. You can offer them, let's say, a fixed return. So, uh, hey, if you're going to provide money into this deal, I will provide you a 6% APR, okay? What are they getting at the bank? I don't know, maybe 1%. So I'm gonna provide you a 6% and we're gonna record your money on the deed of the property. We're gonna actually record it on title so that you are protected, that your money is secured by this asset. It's not like a you know, Bernie Madoff or some sort of crazy fund where the money goes into this account and, and can all disappear. You're actually recorded as a lender on the property. And there's other ways that you can sweeten that. It depends on the, the opportunity and a, a lot of different factors, but you can also offer a profit share to them. So on top of their 6%, whatever profit, especially if this is a flip or a transaction that's gonna move relatively quickly, um, you may have your numbers run and you know that you're gonna come out of this or at least you're projecting to come out of this at a certain profit and then you're gonna profit share or you're gonna JV, joint venture um, with them on the profit. So maybe they're gonna get 10% of your profits or 20% of your profits or something like that where it still makes sense and you want it to be a win-win for each side. And that can work really well. You may have someone who's going to go into the property with you as an owner. So private money, we've done this before where we had two homes on a lot and our partner that went in with us, 50%, okay? 50% and 50%. We went in 50%, okay? So we split everything 50-50, the down payment, any expenses, any income that came off the property, and they were gonna live in one of the houses and we were gonna live in the other. Turns out they didn't end up moving into the other house and we rented it out and it was fine and that all worked. We still paid for our share and what was equivalent of us living in the property. We rented out the other house we owned that property for many years and then sold it for profit. And again, split everything 50-50. I recommend you have some legal input and accounting input. And I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, but there's ways to do this and structure it right and structure it well, and it can be a win-win for both sides. So there's all kinds of ways to do private money. Um, there's other strategies that you can do um, to do this. But these are some of the ones that I see that are the most popular and that work really well. And that is a way to get into real estate if you do not have the funds yourself or maybe you have some of the funds and you need more. That is a powerful tool. All right, so we covered using private money, other people's money, bank money. Now, quick summary and we're gonna wrap this up. I wanted to make sure that you got out of this the five benefits to real estate that are major, major, major benefits that create real estate to be a vehicle of wealth accumulation over time that is conservative yet astounding ROI return on investment. So thank you for being part of this live stream training, our first ever. Comment below again and we will send you a link to a calculator that will analyze a rental property for you. Comment below and we will raffle off a one hour free Zoom consultation with me on any real estate deal that you're looking at. And watch for us on YouTube under Al Seeds. Thanks for being a part of this. See you next time.